I'm going to ask the governor and majority leaders, can you tell us about what bipartisan solutions might be out there to protect Minnesotans against gun violence after the shootings we saw yesterday and this morning? And we'll start with the governor, please. Good morning, Dana. Thank you to Forum News Service and to all of our journalists for uh, for this important forum. Uh, yeah, I think like so many Minnesotans and Minnesota parents, we woke up this morning and sent our children back off to to schools with with heavy heart, um, with a with a sense of uh, sadness um, for students who won't come home. I spent the morning out in the Richfield School with with the leaders in the community, and more importantly, sitting in the staff room as they process this. I, I think the one thing is, is that unites us around this, and we're seeing it both here in Minnesota and across the country, is um, these violent crimes need to be stopped, and, and gun violence is a part of it, and, and understanding this is multifaceted. We need to have no tolerance um, for these crimes, and we have, need to have no tolerance for the causes of these crimes. So listening to an intermediate school district that, that understands this, that has many of their students who have had interactions with law enforcement prior to yesterday's shooting, um, I think there's a lot of good bipartisan solutions out there. I want to thank the legislative leaders that there's there's a lot of overlap in this. We believe getting those resources to the communities to let them make the best decisions possible. If that means that they need more public safety officers, that's a decision they'll make. If they need more support services, they will need that to happen. And then working with community groups who know these kids to make it happen. But those are things that we're uh, certainly able to do. And I would say the state, where you see the state involved in this, whether it's BCA and some of those services, um, we proposed a statewide violent crime task force called the Fusion Center a couple of years ago. I think that's a potential that's out there. And I look at all the proposals that are from across uh, the caucuses and the spectrums. Um, the commitment to getting this right for Minnesotans is certainly there. So I think those are some starting points. And uh, I look forward to the legislative leaders and the community leaders uh, advocating. And I feel, you know, like all of you do, the sense of urgency around this as a top priority um, the legislative session has the great potential to get some of this done. Senator Miller, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, good morning, Dana. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, having us this morning. Um, we certainly send our condolences to uh, the victims of uh, yesterday's tragedy and also want to thank law enforcement and local officials for their prompt swift action to um, really take control of the scene and, and help protect others. I think uh, we hear it every single day from people across the state that violent crime is out of control in the state of Minnesota and we need to work together. And it's gonna take public officials at all levels, all parties uh, to address this issue. And uh, Senate Republicans are gonna put forward proposals to provide funding for more police officers. Uh, we will also put forward proposals to hold violent criminals accountable for their actions. As the governor said, I think there um, are some similarities in, in the proposals that are getting put forward. And also, I think it's really important for us to, to support law enforcement, show law enforcement our appreciation. It is an honorable profession. Uh, law enforcement is. And uh, over the course of the last couple of years, uh, there's been a, a negative spotlight put on the profession. And I think it's up to us as public officials to show our respect and our appreciation uh, to law enforcement. And yesterday's tragedy uh, was another example of how important it is uh, for law enforcement to be there. When people call 911, when there's an emergency, uh, they want law enforcement and other public uh, public officials to show up and public safety officials. And that's exactly what happened yesterday. So um, I do believe that there are some opportunities for us to work together to address public safety as I believe it's, it's the number one issue facing our state right now. Leader Winkler. I think you asked a critically important question for all of us. No 15 year old in Minnesota should be killed outside of uh, his or her school. And uh, it feels like in many ways, we are going from one tragic event to the next in this state, in this country over the last uh, several years. And I think it's our responsibility as leaders to be 
responsible, to be careful, to be sober in our assessments, to be honest in looking for solutions, and to recognize that this is a problem that affects uh, all of Minnesota. This is not a partisan problem that we face. This is not a uh, one community and not another community. This is not one uh, neighborhood and not another. This affects everybody. And we need to be uh, bringing out our best leadership in order to address uh, this. And I think in the last uh, two years, uh, since the murder of George Floyd, uh, the civil unrest, uh, and all the things that we have been going through on crime and its increase in recent years, we have found a way to work across the aisle uh, to make changes. And because we are in divided government, we have no choice but to find a way to work together. And Minnesotans expect us to do it. And I think uh, the leaders on this call and governor have a record of finding a way forward and we can do it again and have to do it again. Uh, what's encouraging is to hear the amount of overlap between what Senate Republicans are saying, what House DFLers are saying, and what the governor is saying uh, about solutions, which includes supporting local law enforcement, so supporting local communities, uh, helping to identify where state resources can be more effectively deployed. Uh, there are shortages um, in and concern about the ability to recruit police officers. Our public safety system uh, through the courts, through the prosecutors, probation, uh, community corrections, all of it is taxed right now uh, and having a hard time dealing uh, with a, a rise in crime during a pandemic. So we have to be supportive of that system. We have to be careful not to uh, attack or to offer simple narratives that don't really address the problem because the, the, gr the gravity of uh, these uh, shootings, the gravity of the crime that we're seeing, the gravity of uh, antisocial behavior that we're seeing across the board is real, and it's uh, on us to bring our very best to stop it. And I hope all of us can be committed to doing that this session. I'm going to move next to Mary Lahammer, who had a question, followed by Trey Muse. Thank you, Dana. I would like to start with the governor answering and then Senator Miller. And this is a follow-up, Dana, to your question and I'd like to get a specific answer on gun control. Everybody talked about public safety, the governor, all the caucuses have agreed that public safety is a top priority. Can you specifically address whether any form of gun control will be proposed and could move through the legislature to your desk, Governor? Well, Mary, I appreciate it. And I, I think you heard, and, and I, I think the tone, I'm really grateful for the leadership talking about this one because um, the pain of standing out there and looking at uh, a memorial with little footballs and stuffed animals again at a school is is simply unbearable and, and cannot stand. Um, with that being said, I think you heard there's multiple things on this, and I don't want to oversimplify. Those who would say that, you know, uh, that if we simply did more on guns, it, it in of itself would make a difference. Um, we know it's more complex than that, but we also know, for example, the truck park shooting, the individual who got those guns, got them from somebody who straw purchased 30 guns prior to that purchase. And then we had multiple shootings in there. I think working with law enforcement who do believe there's some things we can do. There are things that have passed in states from Florida on like, um, background checks, enhanced background checks to make sure these straw purchases don't happen. And then some of the red flag um, laws that, that let families know of summons, because we still know that the vast majority of we, we still have suicides and, and things that happen with firearms. So I, I think the tone amongst the legislature is open. I, I understand how divisive some of these things can be, but it, it feels to me that Minnesota and the country understand we have to tackle these things. There's multiple ways to do it. I would certainly welcome the conversation and would certainly sign legislation that dealt with things that have been proven to reduce gun violence. Um, but I do want to note that if, if don't believe that's the only solution or the simple solution to fix all of this, it's more complex. Um, Mary, to answer your question, um, I think you asked me next, I think it's highly unlikely to see any uh, gun control measures uh, move through the Senate this year. The focus uh, should not be on uh, law-abiding citizens. The focus should be on non-law-abiding citizens and uh, holding uh, criminals accountable for their actions, and that's where our focus is going to be uh, this session. And Senator Miller, if I could follow up, do you think, though in light of yesterday's fatal shooting, that there's anything new or different that, that the Senate can and should consider? Mary, I think there are still, uh, at least from my perspective, perhaps others have more details on 
what exactly happened yesterday and what caused uh, the shooting to happen and, and who, who the shooter was and how they possessed the firearm. So I don't have that information right now. Um, so I, I don't, I just, I don't have the information. Our next question is from Trey and then following we'll have one from Theo. Thank you. I was hoping to pivot to infrastructure. I'm interested in hearing uh, what everyone has to say about the size of a bonding bill this year, given uh, the surplus and given the backlog of infrastructure projects throughout the state. How big of a bonding bill would everyone like to see come through this session? Well, I'll just not answer. I'll let the others go first, only that I put out a bonding bill. So the 2.7 billion number is mine. And, and I think as we've seen it, uh, we've been very successful in this space bipartisanly. Um, I do respect that the legislature will work on this. There's projects that need to be done. I think um, most of us agree on things like broadband, these uh, projects, roads and bridges that need to be done. Um, and, and I would just make the case that we highlighted in addition to the bonding bill, um, setting aside the resources that we have in the surplus to make sure that the federal dollars that are going to flow in the Infrastructure Act, um, that is a once in a generation opportunity, we should not leave any of those federal dollars on the table because we don't have the local matching. And I think this helps local communities, counties and things if the state has the ability to do some of that. So this is a proposal I put out. Um, it, it's worked on a lot of uh, community groups that worked on it. Now the legislature will work will work their side of things. But I think the number is is reasonable. It falls clearly within our borrowing limits. It puts the state on solid financial grounds and it, it gets at the backlog. I, th I think the question is uh, what size bonding bill can, can pass through the Minnesota House of Representatives as everyone knows a bonding, the final bonding bill has to originate and pass through the House and before it comes over the Senate. So it has to be bipartisan. Um, with all due respect to the governor, I, my, oh, my first thought is his bill is probably too large uh, to pass through uh, the Minnesota House of Representatives and, and get the, the bipartisan support that it needs. But I do believe there's bipartisan support in the House and the Senate uh, and uh, really a desire to work together with the governor to pass a bonding bill this session that focuses on core infrastructure projects, roads and bridges, asset preservation. And the other important thing that we all need to understand, and um, certainly from my perspective, is we know these federal funds are coming in, the federal infrastructure dollars. The latest number I heard is roughly $4.8 billion uh, over the next five years. And what we need to figure out is how does that fit with the needs that are being proposed in the state and how do they correlate and work together and then in addition to that what are the what are the matching funds some of those federal funds need matching funds from the state government and others don't so i think we need a better understanding or at least i need to have a better understanding of how those federal funds come in how they work together with the current projects and then from there what are the additional needs at the state level that are core infrastructure projects. Once you start getting into these more local uh, projects, uh, it gets more and more difficult, but if we can focus on roads and bridges, asset preservation, taking care of the buildings that we currently have, um, I do think that uh, there's a, a great opportunity to put forward a, a strong infrastructure package that will uh, earn the bipartisan support that it needs. I could just follow up, Senator Miller. What uh, what does the Senate GOP uh, consider to be a reasonably sized bonding bill this year? I know you talked about whether or not it would pass through the House, but what is the the ideal bonding bill amount for the Senate GOP? Thank you for that follow up question. We're still trying to figure that out because we still need to know um, how the federal funds will correlate with 
uh, with the state needs. And we will likely have a bonding bill. We know that a bonding bill has to originate in the House and pass through the House first. But um, just in case they can't come to an agreement, or we need to have a backup plan. So the Senate will propose a bonding bill. And Senator Bach and his committee have been traveling all across the state of Minnesota looking at those projects. And uh, they are in the process of, of compi compiling everything and uh, and putting together a bill. I will say that I believe the number included in the forecast is 880 million, give or take, uh, we'll say between eight and $900 million is uh, included in the forecast. So anything above that uh, would need additional debt service that's not included uh, in the forecast. And I think I, I can just intervene as well, because this is where the minority actually uh, matters in, in terms of their votes in the Senate and in the House. I would say we should be uh, taking this opportunity to make it as robust as we can and tying it to public safety. Uh, we also have projects like uh, the West Metro uh, Public Safety Regional Facility that was in a bonding bill previously. Those are issues and areas that really tie into the, uh, the incident from yesterday. Um, I represent uh, the western suburbs, Edina, Bloomington, Eden Prairie, and Minnetonka, and all of them, with the exception, I believe, of Eden Prairie, all of them responded yesterday's to yesterday's um, incident. Um, as soon as we heard, um, I my district abuts Richfield, so um, reached out to the mayor. Uh, these are areas where we can also support our first responders and our law enforcement through bonding to making sure that they have the facilities, state-of-the-art technology to be able to respond um, to these incidents across our state. Um, but then let's think back to that question about what we can do. Uh, my first thought was, how can we prevent this? So yes, we need the foot soldiers on the ground to help us um, manage the situation and, and the tragedy, but we want to prevent them from happening in the first place. And I would say our caucus is really focused on public safety from the prevention side, from proven strategies. And we have a, a host of them that I can share with you. But at the same time, uh, we know that um, back to bonding, this is an important opportunity for our state to leverage bonding, to leverage the federal infrastructure bill to leverage our surplus and to have a Minnesota moment where we can really um, set us up for a success for the future, for jobs, for broadband. Broadband is the infrastructure of the 21st century, so we know we can't start businesses across Minnesota without it. We can't have kids learning virtually without it because some of them are still going to um, the parking lot of a McDonald's um, to do their homework. That's unacceptable in this day and age, and we have an opportunity to fill the gap that the federal government has there in broadband, uh, but the, the Senate Democrats will be surely looking at a, a big a big footprint for our state um, to really make a difference uh, for years to come. I think it would be a great question to get an answer from Representative Doubt on, since uh, as we pointed out, uh, we do have to get a bill through the House. I'm confident that House DFLers will. Here's how it's going to work. The House DFL is going to roll out a bill. We'll do it according to committee deadlines. It'll go through a process. We'll bring it to the floor. We'll have just enough Republican projects in it to be tempting. Representative Doubt will seek to defeat the bill on the floor. Uh, it will go down. That will start the real negotiations. The Senate will try to hold back its cards as long as possible and will be at an end of session uh, scramble to put together a bonding bill in a closed room. That is usually how it works. It usually starts with the majority in the House uh, actually putting a bill forward, and it'll be a great bill with a lot of important projects. And uh, you can also, uh, I hope, express appreciation to Democrats for passing robust bonding bills in lots of Republican districts without any Republican help. We will also be doing that this year, uh, just like they did in D.C. So uh, there's a lot of uh, dance to be done uh, before a bonding bill is done this session, but we will be uh, bringing forward a robust package like the governor did and putting our cards on the table and say, and try to get this uh, going and getting it done as quickly as we can. And what would the House DFL like to see in terms of an overall dollar amount? You know, how much would the House DFL like to spend on bonding this year? The governor has the disadvantage of uh, going first, and then we get to just go up a bit above that to show that we're slightly more generous. So I would think that the 2.7 is probably a floor for us. Well, I can uh, chime in as this is the one where I'm probably the most relevant today. Um, 
appreciate everybody for being on and for inviting us to to share our outlook on this on the session. So thanks for what you do at the Capitol. And it's fun to be back and, and see a few of you in person. So, um, you know, on the Bonnie Bill, I, I appreciate Representative Winkler, uh, his his uh, and in the past, he's not necessarily wrong. But, um, you know, his caucus is leading uh, the House uh, chamber right now, and um, they have the power to change that. Let's put people at a table and let's talk. Let's figure out uh, what makes sense. Um, my caucus, I've been very vocal uh, this this year so far about our openness to a bonding bill, about that bill being, um, you know, probably about the size of the biggest one we've ever done in history. Um, if, if there's a way that you can make me look unreasonable, uh, you'll have to stretch to do it because I've been pretty vocal about the fact that we're open to that. Um, but I think the way to do it is let's let's not start with that dog and pony dance about you know trying to you know have a standoff in the house chamber about whether we're going to support a bill or not or put just enough republican projects why don't we put the projects in the bill that belong in the bill why don't who cares whose district they're in um and let's keep projects out of the bill that really don't belong in the bill and and i think that's what we're going to be focused on this year and if we really want to work together Let's not make those just words here on an interview with the press. Let's actually do it. So that's my challenge to all of you. Um, I've got my sleeves rolled up. We're ready to talk about a bonding bill. I want it to be, and, I, and I've been vocal about this for years. I want it to be heavy in infrastructure. I love uh, transportation related stuff. I love the wastewater and drinking water stuff. My caucus does as well. Uh, we love the broadband stuff. Um, I actually think we all need to be kind of reasonable too about, I mean, I appreciate the governor's number about 2.7. I know that's our, our capacity and, uh, or it's even higher than that. I appreciate Representative Winkler's number saying that's his floor because he's going to show they're more generous. Um, but the reality is if we bond for that much, um, those projects will never get done before two years from now when we pass the next bonding bill. So why don't we authorize what we're ready to and what our what our actual capacity to get the work done and um, and not overextend ourselves and and let's not politicize it by saying well I outbid you. Um, let's just sit down together and and solve the problem and and pass a bill that Minnesota needs. Um, and when we do that, I'll have my sleeves rolled up and I'll be there. And you need eleven of my votes and I'll I'll be proud to put them. Uh, up for a bill that makes sense. And let's do it early in session. Let's not hold it hostage till the end. Um, you've got my commitment on that. I would note that Leader Winkler has started negotiating with you in the chat, it looks like. So something for you both to consider. In the meantime, um, I have Theo followed by Jesse for next questions. Hey, everybody, I'm going to veer back into breaking news here. Governor, I want to put you on record. Uh, this morning, uh, Hennepin County Sheriff Dave Hutchinson said that he was going to retire at the end of his term, uh, but not resign. You've called for him to resign. Do you think retirement is enough, or are you concerned about having a lame duck sheriff in the biggest county in the state for almost a year? Yeah, well, good morning, Theo. Um, yeah, this is just a sad situation. I think I think this issue of, of people's personal you know, addictions or whatever may be a case here. I, again, grateful that that the sheriff and no one else died in this. And, and I just thought from an effectiveness perspective, especially at a time when the collaboration, which you saw yesterday is so critically important. I will, do wanna note the professionalism in the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office. Um, they've got a lot of capable folks there that, that serve in positions, just like many of us know, we lead an organization, but our uh, the folks who work with us are also able to do that. I think the, the sheriff made a decision not to run again because it is ultimately the voters' responsibility. I, I do think a transition would probably be best. That's not my place to make it, but I do think that um, to moving on because you're hearing a lot of, I, I think, very positive collaboration about this across the spectrum of a very difficult issue. And I think having any distractions probably not, you know, is not that healthy. And then, you know, that's that's my personal opinion. Again, I'm, I'm just... Uh, it's just a bad situation in terms of personally, but I, I do know that the, the, the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office is strong. They'll figure this out. Uh, leaders Winkler and Lopez Franzen, since you live in the county, I'd like to put you on the record as well. Uh, retire enough or resign? Well, I'm, I'm happy to go. I think that Sheriff Hutchinson made the right decision to not seek reelection. If he were to resign, he would be uh, replaced in that position by the county board. Uh, and we have an active and ongoing campaign this year for the voters of Hennepin County to choose the next sheriff. So a resignation would require uh, the county board to make a replacement that could potentially change the uh, or put weight on behalf of one of the candidates. 
uh, for sheriff. And so I think uh, his decision to not run again is uh, the right one. And uh, I think we should let the voters decide who his replacement will be. I would just say I'm glad that he decided to retire and take care of his mental health and addiction and whatever other issues we all are struggling with. So I think it's a, a good choice to, or a decision on his part to um, open the door for a new sheriff to uh, handle the issues of our county, which are large at this point. Okay, thank you all. Next up, I have Jesse followed by Bill Werner. I'm um, sticking on the breaking news theme. I did want to ask about the group of Republican senators had pressed for an audit of the Minnesota Department of Education over feeding our future. Um, Governor Walls, Democratic leaders, do you support an audit or are there other steps you believe should be taken? Yeah, well, thank you, Jess, for the question. Absolutely. I said we always um, support that. I think transparency and uh, is the best disinfectant on many things. I also like to note that how incredibly proud I am of the Minnesota Department of Education. My commissioner was nearly jailed over contempt of saying that these should not be paid. Um, they're the ones that identified this early in the process. And I think um, that responsibility of stewardship over public funds is, is always a top priority. So I think anytime there's, there's a question for, a, for an independent audit on things, um, it should make sense. And, and, but I wanna be very clear about this. The uh, amount of good work that was done, especially around feeding our children and keeping families out of poverty during the pandemic has been, um, has been spectacular. I think if we're going to audit, we need to audit across all the programs, not just those that serve those least fortunate amongst us. And again, um, the system of checks and balances and things that we've learned, some of you know, we worked hand in hand bipartisanly when we came into this office to uh, to fix the MINLAR system, something that had been going on for 10 years to try and save that. When we see a situation like MDE, um, we're gonna have to figure out why the federal government didn't do more to do this. And, and of course, just to be very clear, we stopped paying. They told us to keep paying them. We refused. They went to court and the judge ordered us in contempt of court to continue paying. At that point in time, we followed up with the FBI. And, and again, I don't want to speak out of turn on where this investigation is, but I welcome anything that brings to light to this um, because I think it makes us better stewards. I think you wanted DFL leaders to weigh in. Absolutely. We should have an audit of any program where there's a question about the use of public funds. That's absolute uh, basic transparency and oversight of government, and the public has a right to expect that. I'd like to chime in on, on this one as well. I appreciate the governor and the administration's efforts to, to find that fraud. And um, I think this isn't a partisan issue, right? I mean, we, we all... Uh, swear an oath to, to do our jobs. I, I would go a bit further, and this isn't an, an, an accusatory thing in any way, shape, or form, but any of the dollars, the federal dollars that weren't appropriated by the legislature, I would like a very detailed accounting of when those payments were made, who they were made to, um, just so that we can follow up and see if any, you know, see if anything kind of sticks out as something that that we would find as uh, irregular. Um, I, I, I do feel very strongly that even those federal dollars uh, that came for pandemic relief and, and, and other purposes related to this pandemic need to be appropriated by the Minnesota legislature. That is our constitutional uh, duty and, and uh, it's, it's the way that we operate our state government here. I do understand that there was a need to, to, for the administration to spend some dollars quickly and um, you know uh, certainly we need to make arrangements for that, but I, I really am critical of the legislature for not taking a more active role um, in the oversight of those dollars uh, early on and, and, and frankly, even continuing. So, um, and I'm not trying to accuse anybody or say that anything was mishandled. Um, I just believe it's the legislature's responsibility and it's, it's our form of government where we have checks and balances to, to make sure that, uh, that things are handled properly and that nobody has too much control over any one thing. So um, I, I just, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's what we should do and it's what our job is. So um, I'd like to see that as we move forward. And I agree with the audit. I, I've served most of my time in the Health and Human Services uh, Committee in the Minnesota Senate, and uh, there are a lot of federal transfers that come uh, that were just a pass through. So to uh, Representative Dowd, sometimes we're able to do that, sometimes we can't. Uh, but even ARP funding, a lot of it went to communities that uh, uh, were audited by the federal government as well. So those are they have clawbacks as well. So I am all for 
uh, transparency and for auditing every state penny um, taxpayer dollars. So um, we have nothing to hide and we were gonna be able to find that out with uh, more transparency in this audit. Next up, we have Bill followed by Sean. Thank you, Dana. I appreciate you facilitating and thank you leaders for participating. I wanna get us back to the crime issue. Um, voters, as they make their decision, whether to give control of the legislature to one party or the other, to, or to keep it split as it is now, they know what your views are um, on uh, the, the basic issues uh, on, on crime, all the way from gun control uh, to uh, uh, more cops on the street. I want you to tell voters what you're going to do in terms of addressing the root causes. There are those who say this is a moral problem. There are those who say it's an economic problem, that it's a mix of the two. Voters want to know how are you going to address the root causes of this? Uh, please, the governor and leaders, if you can elaborate on that or summarize uh, so that voters have an idea that help them make a decision this fall. I can chime in as well, because I mentioned this earlier about proven strategies to prevent crime from happening in the first place. Uh, again, we have a, a big opportunity for a state to spend some resources on those uh, prevention strategies. One of them is in youth intervention. We know that a lot of these uh, incidents that have happened in the last few months, uh, three of them carjacks, carjackings in my district in a period of a month. Uh, a lot of them were, were perpetrators that were youth, they were younger uh, individuals. And we know that the pandemic has put a lot of strain on schools and social programs and, and just the social interactions that uh, all of us are used to. So we need to go back and say, where can we uh, stop the crime and the violence immediately? Because if we're still talking about three carjackings in a month in November, then we have bigger issues. We need to stop that violence now. Uh, so the other piece, too, is schools. Schools are a partner for us for making sure that kids are showing up to school, have the resources they need, have the housing, have the food, have the mental health. And when I reached out to my mayors in, in my area in, in law enforcement, I met with all of them in the Western Metro. They are asking for our support when it comes to those wraparound services. They want us to be able to fund those areas that they cannot control. And we also have to support them because they are short staffed. They uh, just in Minneapolis, you all know this, we have at least 190 officers that are court mandated to be filled. Where are we going to get that workforce? Um, I'm a daughter of a a former cop, and I understand the sacrifices that law enforcement does every day, put, putting their own safety and their families on the line, just like we saw yesterday. And we need to support them, but at the same time, we also need to stop that crime from being, um, from them going to crisis to crisis. So schools are part of it, making sure people have uh, the, the basic needs met. And in this particular moment in time, we have an opportunity to look at those priorities and, and fund them. Uh, so youth intervention, we funded that at about 5 million right now, it's 7.5 7 million. The true cost of fully funding uh, youth intervention programs are closer to 20 to 30 million. So uh, we've underinvested in areas that we know are proven key strategies to keep youth away from uh, violence, but we also have to know that we are have all suffered, right? Mental health, um, the strain of people working from home and juggling childcare, making sure that they have those supports. It's all tied um, to your question, Bill. So I think we need to really look at, at those proven strategies uh, that have data-driven uh, results and start funding them and youth intervention, child care, uh, making sure people have housing and adequate supports and making sure that we're able to do that. This session is, is a big focus of our caucus. Uh, Dana, if I may, a follow up with the Republican participants on this, uh, Majority Leader Miller uh, uh, and uh, Minority Leader Doubt. Is there room in these negotiations where we're really dealing with a budget session here, sort of, right? Is, is there room in these negotiations for significant increases in the kinds of programs that the Democrats, that uh, uh, Leader Lopez Franzen is talking about and that I know Governor Walls is talking about and that the Speaker and Majority Leader of the House are talking about? Can Is there room for significant dollar amounts uh, of investments in those areas? Uh, well, Bill, crime prevention is great but people are getting robbed. Carjackings are a regular occurrence right now. Innocent people are getting shot. 
what we need to do right now is get tough on crime. And we do that by holding people accountable for their actions. If someone breaks the law, there should be consequences. We need more police officers. We need to provide funding for more police officers because more cops results in less crime. So that's where Senate Republicans are going to focus. Crime is absolutely out of control right now. So once we get it better under control by providing more police officers, funding for more police officers and holding violent criminals accountable, then we can start talking about more crime prevention measures, because I think those are important as well. But right now, the most important thing we can do is get tough on crime. Governor, do you agree with that? Well, I think it's a combination of things. I do believe there's a triage situation where you you have to, in the moment, if we're seeing these things, domestic crimes and, and homicides are up in Minnesota. We're at a 30-year high in highway deaths. Um, as far as Minnesotan security is, we lost 105 people in the last 36 hours on, on the COVID pandemic. So I think people see this as holistically. I do think people have this expectation that it needs to, needs to stop. Again, having a large number of people be able to respond yesterday was critically important to make sure that this didn't go further. That is really important. But I think what you're hearing from so many people is, and I heard from those school leaders um, people setting their grieving today was is is what are the things that will stop this from happening too? And I think you have to do those simultaneously. I don't think we're talking past each other, um, but I do think we need to be realistic of, of what the numbers are. Where did we start? We started as the third safest state in the country. Minnesotans' expectation of safety is greater than probably any other state in the country, and I'm proud that that's their the way. So if you see increases, you know somebody said, well, this is just a you know, a slight, every one of these is too many. So I think where you hear uh, Leader Miller talking about is, let's have the team to respond immediately and put an end to this. And then I think there's an agreement there. And then I think you hear Leader Franzen talking about how is the number one carjacking suspect in Minneapolis an 11 year old girl that we're looking for? How, how did that happen? How is the average age of carjackers 14? How did we take someone in the Western suburbs a 15 year old arrest and try and find a place to take him back to 104 times, 104 times. So I think you're not talking past each other. I think leader Miller would say, so the first 103 times didn't make a correction so that he was still doing another crime. And I think I'm hearing leader Lopez, I don't want to put words in your mouth is how did we fail having 103 times where we didn't get an intervention that worked or stopped this from happening. So I do believe there's a lot of goodwill to try and get this. I don't think that this is an either or. I think what you hear folks talking about is again, it's complex, but we can't just use complex as a reason to say, no, there's not going to be more carjackings and the people who do it, we need to stop. What I'm saying is, we need to be tough on crime, but we need to be tough on the causes of crime. And I don't think, you know, in, in many things we do, you triage in the moment and plan for the future. I think this legislative session can do that because I think you're hearing a lot of goodwill to get there. Thank you, Governor. Thank I'll you. I'll just add one more, I want to jump one more in thing, on this one too. Okay, after Kurt goes, I got one more thing to add. Oh, go ahead, Jeremy. That's fine. I can well, follow. The only, the only thing I was going to add is we need to make sure that kids can be successful in the classroom. I mean, it all comes back to if the youth are doing uh, some of these uh, carjackings and, and they're the, the issue is with youth, then we need to figure out ways to make sure that they're in the classroom and that they have every opportunity to be successful in the classroom. I think, you know, I, this has been a really good conversation <laughs> and I love hearing what everybody's saying. And, and I think it's probably because the question was good, Bill, because um, you asked what about the root cause. I, I can't agree more about holding criminals accountable. Um, and I want to touch on this, and then I want to go to the root of your question, which was uh, the, the cause of this. Um, but our caucus research staff did an interim research project that we're probably going to figure out how to share with all of you, where we went in and analyzed um, in court records uh, the sentencing that happened as uh, on on violent crimes in in we picked an area I think it was Hennepin and Ramsey counties and we picked a period of time, uh, but what we found was um, that sentencing 
there were downward departures on sentencing 46% of the time, which means that they varied from the, from the statutory sentencing guidelines with a downward departure in sentencing 46% of the time. Um, that's kind of shocking uh, that, that not only do we have a shortage of law enforcement officers out there kind of patrolling, keeping neighborhoods safe and being a, a, a presence uh, of safety on the streets, um, that once we do catch a criminal, they're reoffending. We're not holding them accountable. Um, and and I think the word on the street is that you can get away with this stuff. Um, it was shocking to me. I, I, t I keep telling this story about this carjacking, and you probably have all figured out. It's somebody we know around the Capitol. His wife was was carjacked in St. Paul, and and. It was a 14-year-old kid that held a gun to his wife's head while she negotiated to get her two-and-a-half-year-old child out of the back seat before they stole her vehicle at 11 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday in St. Paul. I mean, this is the life of, of what mothers are worried about. Um, and until we get tough on crime, this is not, there is no other way. But crime and getting tough on crime is the short term. That's the, we must triage this right now. To solve this problem long term, we can't ignore the fact that if, if you're a, and I keep repeating this statistic too, if you are a minority student or a low income student in the Minneapolis school district, you have less than a 50% chance of graduating high school. Think about that. We are failing these kids. Our system is failing these kids. And until we come together, and I love what, what uh, Senator uh, Lopez Franson said about we need to fund the things that are proven to work because there are all kinds of things, education reform things that our teachers union in this state has stood strong against that have worked incredibly well to get these kids the tools they need to be successful in other states. But we can't do them here because the teachers union won't let Democrats vote for them. And I don't mean to say something so political, but it is a goddamn fact. And it's time that we solve that problem. And until we get those kids, the education they need and they deserve and the tools they need to be successful, they're gonna keep holding guns to people's heads on the street. And that's the long-term solution to the problem. And we can't look the other way and ignore it any longer. And I'm sorry, I got a little passionate. Governor, well, you're, you're a former will. teacher. What do you think about that? Well, I would note that it's not just minority students that are engaged in this behavior. Um, I think the idea of, of the successfulness, I think we do need to understand the correlations of crime. We need to understand if the recidivism rates are there. We also do know from research that, um, that the pathways out of that crime um, are many, and there are proven statistics. So I don't think you disagree. Um, I think you've got folks that, are, that want to find solutions. At the end of the day, this is about fixing it. I think there are things out there that'll do it. I think you're hearing a lot of things that are happening. I think you're seeing um, historic investments that we're making in uh, a multi approach to this, um, whether it be uh, a historic increase in early learning scholarships for 10,000 families to use their portable ability to deal with that or to make sure that we're beefing up those schools. I would encourage all of you if you're not, and, and I even say this as a teacher, intermediary districts are, are an interesting thing. And they also deal with some of the most challenging students that, that come with with issues, whether they be learning or social. And I think they're doing some really amazing things. And that the, the double tragedy of this, of happening at this school that has been on the forefront of much of what you heard Leader Doubt talking about and others, this is, a, this is a school district that deals with that. And an intermediary school district is different than what many of us are used to. So I, I do think having this conversation, I think it's important. I think Minnesotans expect us to. And these are the type of passionate, um, solution-focused discussions that should happen. I mean, this is the beauty of what the legislature can do. So I, I welcome I welcome them having this. And I think it's important that we uh, we be authentic and say what we think. It, it, and um, I welcome that. I think there's, you know, not just a rebuttal for the sake of rebuttal, but rebutting where we can find the right answers. So um, well, this yeah. is a healthy discussion. Can I just, I think there's an important part of this conversation that's been missing. And that is that if you don't spend time sitting with people and listening to what their experiences are, hearing uh, from people who live in neighborhoods with uh, historically high crime rates and listen to what they think their community needs, uh, then we're not doing, if we don't do that, we're not doing our jobs. Um, and if we're not listening to what they think the solutions are and look to be partners to the state, we are not going to get to the core solutions that we need. There are actually a lot of people uh, around uh, the metro area, uh, which I'm most familiar with, 
who are involved every day in trying to stop violence from happening, who are putting their lives and safety on the line to uh, look out for their own neighbors, people who care about the kids who might be involved in crime and care about the people who might be victims of crime. And there, this conversation all too often happens about other people or with solutions that we come up with that we think will solve the, solu the, the problem for other people. And the reality is that we need to be better partners and we need to know our neighbors. There has to be a level of humanity and engagement if we want to actually solve this problem. Um, you know, I can, for example, uh, in North Minneapolis, there is a former school building uh, that the city, the county, the state, and the school district wanted to convert into a shelter for women. And the community uh, saw the proposal and said, we don't need another investment and for a trauma center in our neighborhood. What we actually need is a youth center. We have no place for teenagers to go. And when the neighborhood said, we don't want a shelter, we want a youth center, all of a sudden, all those entities walked away and there was no project and that building stands vacant today. That project is something that is currently, the, the neighborhood is trying to put together a project to bring a youth center like that for at-risk youth in North Minneapolis. And you wouldn't know it if you didn't go there to listen. So my point here is that a lot of the political debate, a lot of the rhetoric is geared towards winning an election and persuading voters whose lives are not on the line in the way that a lot of neighborhoods uh, experience crime right now. And we need to be there and show up and listen and actually follow through. I'd like to just make a clarifying statement too. And I, I agree 100% with what you're saying, Representative Winkler. Um, this isn't about politics. It isn't about elections. I get a lot of uh, flack every, every once in a while from leaders in your caucus who say, why is that doubt still hanging around here? He needs to move on. You know why I'm still hanging around here? Because this sort of issue is what I'm passionate about. And, and I think we can come together to fix it. And I love the fact that we're hearing so many things right now where, where we've got overlapping agreement. Um, but this is an issue. The thing I wanted to clarify was uh, the governor made a comment about it's not just race. And I was very clear in my comments that it was low income and minority students who have less than a 50% chance of graduating. I have no idea what color that 14 year old was that held that gun to that woman's head. Um, but I'll tell you what, it ripped my heart out of my chest because my nephew is 14 years old and I take him skiing and you know we do all kinds of fun snowmobiling, we do all kinds of fun stuff. And I just think, my God, this is a baby. And, and, and here kids this age, um, are, are, are holding a gun to somebody's head to steal their car. Uh, it, it just, we all together have to do better. And I, and I think we can, and I'm, I'm very enlightened that we've heard some things that we can agree on here today. Let's roll up our sleeves and do it. That's why I'm here. And can I, I know Dana, you have more questions, but I, I can't help it. I'm, I'm, I'm a young mom with young kids in the suburbs and to the point of being an electioneer, um, I am very concerned just with uh, what I see in the classroom, what I've heard from the last nine years I've been serving my district where special education has been underfunded. And I hear from the moms in my communities that they are um, stressed out with their families and their kids are acting out. And this is not a 14 year old. These are little children and the South uh, Education Center had kids from preschool to 21. This is not just one segment of our youth. This is our entire youth. We have to invest early. And I just can't stop but mentioning um, special education uh, with personal experiences of how underfunded we have and how our districts are struggling. And we're gonna need them more than ever with this pandemic. Mark my words. Okay, folks, we're gonna have to keep these questions and answers as brief as we can. We have limited time here. Um, next up, I have Sean followed by Shannon. Uh, thank you, Dana. Um, I appreciate this. It's a Hollywood uh, Squares format, so I'm going to call on three of you. First, Senator Miller, followed by uh, Majority Leader Winkler, since we don't have Speaker Hortman here, and then uh, Governor Walls. Uh, Senator Miller, you're proposing tax cuts in the form of a sur uh, from the surplus in the form of a one, t which is one-time money. And this is a tax expenditure style, which has resulted in structural deficits for multiple years, in fact, nearly a decade uh, in, two, in 1999 afterwards. What do you have as a backfill to address any structural deficits? And there are two proposals, one being sports book or sports betting and the other recreational cannabis, which are both known could produce significant money and do in other states. Would you entertain either of these ways, or do you have another idea to backfill the deficit that you can potentially create? 
Sure, Sean, uh, thanks for the question. Um, everyone's talking about it. The state has a massive budget surplus, $7.7 .7 billion and growing. All expectations are when the February forecast comes out, uh, it's gonna be even larger uh, than the $7.7 .7 billion. When the state has this much money, Sean, it means one thing. The state is collecting too much money from the taxpayers. Uh, Senate Republicans will propose permanent ongoing uh, tax relief. So Minnesotans have more money in their pocket every single paycheck, week after week, month after month, year after year. And we feel that's incredibly important, especially with uh, record inflation eating away at family budgets. Uh, we'd like to see Minnesotans have more money in their pocket every single paycheck. Uh, in addition to that, Sean, uh, Senate Republicans will propose the full elimination of the Social Security tax. We know senior citizens are uh, living on a fixed income, also struggling with record inflation. Uh, we feel it's important that they get uh, tax relief uh, uh, this year with the full exemption of the Social Security tax. And I will share with you that the, the tax proposal um, that we are working on will be structurally balanced. Just a quick reminder again, we're running up against time. So if we can keep everything really brief, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Come on, Dana, you're with Sorry. the legislative <laughs> leaders here. You know, we're not going to, and the governor, we're not going to be short in our answer. I'm asking you, so much. You know much, better know. than that. Majority Leader Winkler. We are not proposing permanent ongoing tax cuts. I know that, but in regards to uh, Senator Miller's proposal. Well, we'll have to see what Senator Miller proposes. He likes to say that uh, all uh, bonding bills have to start in the House, so do all tax bills. But somehow I have a feeling that the Senate Republicans will come up with a tax bill sooner rather than later, and it will be part of the negotiation strategy uh, that we all are looking at this session. Obviously, there's going to be give and take on taxes and spending as part of this budget deal. And so uh, we'll have to take a look at what Republicans want to do and what we think we can afford. Let me just be very clear on that. The, the final bonding bill and the final tax bill we know have to originate in the House and, and pass through. But just in case they can't get a bonding bill done or their tax bill isn't robust enough, the Senate will have uh, alternate solutions and uh, proposals that we will put forward. And as uh, Leader Winkler said, he's right. Uh, we do hope to come out early with these proposals because uh, we want to get done uh, early this session. Sean, my, uh, my proposal is get the money back in the hands of Minnesotans as quickly as we can, send them back some money. I think there is uh, openness to look at, especially for the middle class. I will note that the surplus, uh, for many reasons why it's there, but predominantly on revenues, is we have a combination of less government spending. Some of that is, of course, due to the pandemic, and we have record corporate profits. I will note there has not been a single tax raised on the middle class. So if folks are out there spending more and they're spending that money and it's collected by the corporation, that is not an over uh, taxation. That is simply that the economy grew in that direction. With that being said, um, I do think we should balance this. I want to be very clear about the Social Security proposal, because I proposed raising the, the exemption of what's in there. 60% of Minnesotans receiving Social Security don't pay a tax on this. Under the Republican proposal, 90% of the tax savings would go to the 10% of the people at the top. The vast majority of Minnesotans receiving Social Security would not receive that benefit. So raising the bottom up, which we did last time, makes sense because it's fair. Eliminating this will give the most massive tax break to the very wealthiest Minnesotans who aren't depending to live on Social Security. There's a reason that advocates for the aging like AARP and others do not advocate for this proposal because the money we collect from the Social Security on the top earners is used to enhance the quality of life, making Minnesota an age-friendly state. So that's that's the difference there. But I'm open for us talking about some of this, but I am not open and will not um, put us in a structural deficit over a one-time funding. I think there's smarter ways to do it. Okay, we've got Shannon followed by Peter, Pat Lopez, and then Dave. Again, folks, keep it quick. Uh, this is just sort of a general question. Um, Governor, you said triage in the moment and then plan for the future. And in terms of COVID, you know, opening day, there was this just feeling of relief to have everybody kind of back in person. And, and I'm wondering, you know, as we're looking at the numbers of hospitals and the lack of staff, if we're looking at long-term care and not having enough staff, as we're looking at schools and struggling with staff, 
what might be coming early on, what early agreements or something um, in terms of triaging all of these staffing issues as it relates to COVID? And then what plans are there for the future? Yeah, and I'm going to echo uh, Leader Miller's about the nobleness of, of public service folks, uh, our police, our firefighters. I'll also extend that to our nurses who have done heroic things and to teachers. Um, with that being said, again, we had 105 people die. We're still at 1,400 people. You knock to every single healthcare system. We still got you know issues there. But coming off of this, there is going to be people are thinking differently about their jobs. That's why in our proposal, we've done things in there to incentivize the hiring of police, making sure that there's things we can do there on student loans and incentivizing local. The same thing is true of of our healthcare workers. We have a really creative program on certified nursing assistants where we use the National Guard for a month. We went out and looked at who's unemployed, who's taken some classes in healthcare. We went out and called all of those people, a thousand of them, and we've got over 900 of them recruited in, done with their training and back in the workforce. I think that type of creative thinking in, in workforce development is the number one issue that's coming out from businesses. And, and I would just say one of the things we could do, again, to really show that support is We've been debating hero pay now for over a year for folks on the front line. We need to make sure that those are going to be seen as retention bonuses in many cases for those folks who are on the front line. So I think if the legislature, you know, they're going to do their business, I would encourage you to find a compromise around some of this hero pay. We've got UI. We've got some hiring proposals in there that, that I think you could maybe do. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Uh, I can jump in. Um, I believe that uh, public private partnerships are an excellent opportunity to address some of the staffing issues. And I also think that in some ways we can think of higher education a little bit differently. And maybe there are some changes uh, we can do, especially with the community and technical colleges to um, help address some of these staffing shortages. There are uh, three things at least that I think we can come together on uh, very quickly in the legislative session. All uh, folks have been talking about it, Democrats and Republicans, and um, I think we need to just continue to move forward and get these three things done. Number one is the uh, short-term <laughs> staffing solutions for hospitals and, and short-term care providers. Uh, we can find agreement there. We're working on that right now. Uh, number two, uh, 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 presumptive uh, workers' compensation. Uh, Leader Winkler and I worked on this together a couple years ago with some of our colleagues. I think there's an opportunity to get that done. Uh, maybe even uh, this week, the speaker and I spoke yesterday, the governor and I spoke yesterday, Senator Franzen and I spoke yesterday. So I think there's a uh, uh, cooperation and agreement that we could uh, we could get that done. Uh, uh, Representative Dowd, Leader Dowd, I didn't uh, leave you out, but Speaker Hortman said she had already talked to you, so it saved me one phone call from uh, having uh, that I had to make. But um, and then the other thing is the UI Trust Fund. I think we can find uh, early agreement on that. Uh, the governor uh, led on that and has proposed uh, not only taking care of the deficit but uh, fully replenishing that fund. Uh, Republicans will have a hearing uh, next week. Senator Pratt and Senator Rosen have been working on the funding for that. So we'll see that uh, next week in the Senate. So those three things, which Shannon touches on the staffing that you mentioned, but again, as I mentioned, right when I started, I think public private partnerships and what can our higher education institutions, especially the community and technical colleges do to help address some of these staffing shortages, whether it's in healthcare settings, whether it's in classroom settings, whether it's in law enforcement, or whether it's in manufacturing, all across the board, there are staffing shortages. And I think we have the tools to address them. Uh, we just need to put some partnerships in place and have folks uh, working together. I would also add just the elephant in the room and this pandemic, and we'll have a better a shot in our workforce. Well, I, we have to add one other component here, and that is access to paid uh, leave, paid family and medical leave and earn sick and safe time. If businesses are looking for workers, uh, it's awfully hard to find them when parents can't be there because they are taking care of kids or when they've got adults in their lives that they have to look after. And so uh, not only should we be looking at the UI trust fund, but also a uh, billion dollars for frontline workers and a jump start on paid family and medical leave. Uh, that kind of package would be actually bold and help meet the moment uh, in Minnesota right now. And uh, we're ready to move ahead 
as long as we're looking at the whole picture. Peter, is your question for the governor? I know the governor has to hop off uh, in it's the next something week. he might want to respond to. I would leave that up to him. Okay, it's Peter, not directed go ahead. at him. Uh, my question is directed at Senator Miller. Um, one of the reasons we were denied the pleasure of a special session uh, in the November and December was because of a disagreement over what you might do regarding confirmations of governor appointees. Um, we're now in regular session, so you have the authority to do that. Can you let us know what you as a caucus might be doing on confirmation, specifically on those that have been threatened, uh, specifically health, housing, and corrections? Uh, well, let me be very clear. We, we took uh, discussions on, we put any uh, discussions on Commissioner Malcolm on hold uh, in November, uh, trying to get a special session done. Um, but we, we did not come to an agreement on that special session. What I'll share is the Senate takes our responsibility to um, evaluate <laughs> the performance of commissioners uh, very, very seriously. And it is a huge responsibility that the, that the Senate has and will continue to take that responsibility seriously. And all commissioners will be uh, continue to be evaluated, and they'll do that through the the committee process. Well, Peter, this has been such a collegial discussion. I appreciate you bringing up uh, this question at the end. Uh, no, I think we'll be there. I don't disagree. the The senator is right. It is their responsibility. I would make the case that that was the responsibility three years ago, and that these commissioners should be judged on the value of their work and, and what they've done. We, we know in the case of some of them, it was because of an ideological difference, whether it was about addressing climate change. It wasn't performance, it was, um, it was that. So I would just ask, I respect the Senate's right to do this. It, it is the way it should be done. Um, but if it's based on a disagreement with me, uh, rather than the performance of these public servants, because I do have to be very candid. It's challenging right now in the labor market that everybody else is experiencing. We're having that in state government and I'm having it in my office. I'm having a hard time attracting the quality of candidates that we've dismissed to get a replacement in. And I think, again, it goes without saying, in the middle of a global pandemic, the person who's at leading at the point and by all outside measures doing incredible work, it wouldn't make sense just because you disagree with how I've handled COVID. So I hope that that's taken into consideration, but I respect the Senate's um, prerogative to do so. I would just hope that decision is made based on a, a little broader perspective rather than just disagreement. And I'll just chime in. Um, the decisions made and that are being made by the Senate have nothing to do with uh, the governor's decisions on how he uh, reacted to COVID. So I'll respectfully disagree with him or no ideologically um, differences. That's not what we do. Um, we do feel it's important that commissioners uh, interact and communicate uh, with legislators. Uh, we may not always agree, and that's okay, um, but we at least have to have the conversation. And uh, one of the really good examples of a commissioner um, that I like to use is the agriculture commissioner, uh, Commissioner Peterson. Uh, he has gone above and beyond to communicate with the legislature, bring together stakeholders, work with Republicans and Democrats. And again, we don't always agree uh, on the proposals that he puts forward, but he communicates and he works together and he tries to find solutions. And guess what? Commissioner Peterson has been uh, confirmed. So that's sort of a blueprint on how it can work. Uh, nobody takes pride in um, voting to not confirm a commissioner. Trust me, it's not a fun thing to do. Um, however, as I said earlier, it is a huge responsibility that the, that the Senate has, and we uh, take it uh, very seriously. And it is over the course of the commissioner's work, not just on one single issue. I would note, Senator, though, the Senate chairman did say, we have to take these commissioners out because it's the only way the governor listens. And that is a direct quote. And so I, I do think I would ask, I, I'm not saying you, but I think amongst the caucus that there have been very public statements that these people are being removed because they disagree with my politics or ideological rather than the individual. And, and I trust the Senate leader, as he's told me, that they will be judged on their merits accordingly. And I would um, 
if that's what happens, that's the way the system works best. Okay, next up we have Pat Lopez followed by Dave and then we're gonna wrap up. Thanks, um, my question is on Southwest Light Rail. Um, should there be an audit and should there be, should there or should there not be a pause on the project <clears throat> while that audit is going on? There should be an audit. Um, uh, whether a pause is, is more expensive, these are important projects. This is a project that's been going on a uh, better part of a decade long before us, I, I, much like a Minlar's project, um, that I do think it makes sense to audit. Um, and the question that's been brought up is, is there a better system of these uh, joint projects, uh, especially through Met Council? Is there a better way to govern, a better way of, of oversight on that? Um, I would argue that that seems pretty self-evident. We do know that there's always large projects have cost overruns. That doesn't, that doesn't make it excusable. And so uh, I certainly uh, welcome um, that this would be done. I think it's a, a what we should put in in all of our programs. You heard that earlier, whether it's federal funding or whether it's these programs. But I think on many of these, especially when it comes to Met Council, we should have a conversation. I brought this up in negotiations several years ago that I was open to a Met Council governance conversation. Um, and that was that was dismissed at the time that that was not that important. Um, I think it is. So, yes. Um, uh, pause or no pause, or are you undecided still? Well, I think listening to the, the experts on this, uh, a, a pause with the investments that we have, and I just want to be clear that I don't think once something goes that it's on autopilot. I have experience with this where I said, yeah, we're $100 million plus into Minlars, but let's back up for a minute. Let's see if there's a better way to do this. If it's done in that regard, where there's a plan to what's going to happen, what's next, I think the folks involved with this, the chairs in the House and Senate have brought this forward in a bipartisan manner. I, I want to hear what their, what their discussions are on this. And I support the audit. Our, in fact, our lead for transportation, Senator Dibble, asked for one back in July. So we are on the record that we support an audit and transparency. And I am more hesitant about the pause because understanding that it costs a lot of money to pause a project at that size and it goes through and services the Western Super. So those are my communities that have invested a lot of dollars in, in workforce and economic development. So that also requires a pause there. So I think the economic impact might be larger if we have a pause, but I'm open to it. I think we have to learn from the mistakes and the cost overruns in building this project with an audit but we have to separate that from the importance of building a mass transit infrastructure in the Twin Cities metro area. Uh, we have to do it better than what we did in this project, but we have examples, uh, especially the Hiawatha light rail line when it first went in, uh, came in on time and I believe uh, under budget. Uh, so this can be managed well, it needs to be managed well, but uh, the commitment to mass transit, including light rail in this metro area, has to be very strong because no big city exists without a solid mass transit system. And uh, we're not talking about competing with New York or Boston. We're talking about competing with places like Denver and Dallas. So uh, we can do this and we have to do it right. And we have to stay committed to a mass transit system. We need a pause on this permanently. This project should have never happened. Uh, and when you, you know, we, we, we have literally been talking about and, and, and so excited about the fact that we're getting $5 billion from the federal government for uh, transportation dollars. This project alone is three times right now, three times the original estimate. Um, and and it, it would be well more than half of that, uh, that uh, $5 billion that we get from the federal government. And you look at the number of people served by this, it's shocking. This is the most inefficient thing we could ever do. The counties right now who are partners in the North Star Light Rail are asking us to pull the pin. They don't want to pay for it anymore. The ridership, we could hire a helicopter to fly every person that, that rides North Star Light Rail from their home to their job in Minneapolis and save money. That's how inefficient that is. Now, I'm not anti-transit. There are uh, bus rapid transit lines that are incredibly successful and incredibly efficient, um, you know, with a, with a fare box recovery of, of like 80%. I mean, they're... they're we and and there and people love them. I, I've talked to people up in my area who used to ride the North Star, who who said that the bus that they had on that North Star line was much better than the North Star was. They liked it a lot better, and it was quicker. Um, just this is something where I, I think people fall in love with these projects because they're they're glamorous. You know what? I have model train sets at home. I love trains. 
but I love them as model trains, not as some, this is the most inefficient thing that government could do. And we should pull the pin on this now. And if you don't believe me, look at the project in Hawaii that's still not open um, and, and read about that. This thing's been going on 15 years and it's like $10 billion over budget. I mean, it's insane how much money we're spending on this stuff. And it's a waste of money. Uh, Pat, to answer your question, uh, pause and audit. Thank you very much. Dave, would you like to close it out? Yes, a uh, billion dollars today is not gonna be a billion dollars at the end of the biennium or two years farther in the tails. I haven't heard anybody talk about inflation other than a talking point for political campaigns. How do you guys plan to deal with the prospect of inflation as it relates to every dollar figure you guys are talking about? I'll jump in because you know I've talked about this. I've suggested since I've came here that we should budget with and forecast with inflation. Um, it wasn't very, nobody picked up on it because inflation was one, two percent. Now that inflation's up, I'm glad we've got some converts that believe that inflation impacts. It impacts people's lives. It's taking money out of their pocket right now. It's adding cost to everything that we do. I think when you look at the forecast and you talk about this, we, we should plan for inflation. And, and I think when we looked at our budget of talking about this, you're exactly right. We can propose this much spending, but if inflationary costs, you know, even stay at a historical number of two to 2.2%, um, again, 8% right now shocks people because it's hitting into them. The last four years have had an eight percent. That's just the natural order of things. So I think I think both if you're a fiscal conservative, I think the idea of budgeting with inflation that doesn't mean you're necessarily going to spend more money. It means you're going to be honest about what you're spending and honest about what it buys. So I would suggest again, and the legislature will do what the legislature does. I would I would say we should have this conversation about inflation because it's real. I've actually been on the chief author of that bill for many years as well, and many members in the Senate has, have been leading that effort. We should include it. It should be honest and transparent in our budgeting system. I, I would say that um, as a first-termer, I, I remember my meetings with uh, school districts saying that they wanted us to tie their budgets to inflation, and I always resisted. I'm like, that's the legislative job to, to make sure that we fund schools appropriately. I'm tired of fighting over inflation because we're actually making a cut every single biennium in education. So we need that to be factored in, and we should just actually start fully funding services like education instead of cutting every two years. I'm, I'm pretty sure the inflation that, that the voters that we're talking to care about is the inflation in their own family budgets, not in the government's budget. Um, Minnesota families care that their groceries cost 30, 40, 50% more than they did two years ago. Um, everything they buy in their lives every day is costing more. And the money that they have, you know, they've gotten a little pay increase. The money that they have doesn't buy what it used to buy. So they're actually, uh, in, in your, your example about government, that's exactly what every Minnesota family is feeling. And all of the policies that you're proposing about pumping more money into the, into the economy will only make that inflation worse. So we need to analyze what we're actually proposing in state government by pumping a billion dollars here and a billion dollars there more into people's pockets that literally creates more inflation and it's it's part of why we have the problem we do right now because over the course of the last two years the federal government has pumped so much money into the economy and i i, I gotta tell you it's the inflation and in family budgets that voters care about not the inflation in government that's where our priority needs to be it is an interesting uh proposal to make it easier for families to afford everyday things by giving them less money, which seems to be the Republican plan. So I do think that uh, bringing down costs of things that we can affect like childcare uh, or healthcare would make a big difference and making sure that families can actually show up for work and get paid or if stay home if they need to and, and still get paid would make a much bigger difference in the average working families budget in Minnesota than anything that we're seeing from a tax cut proposal. So. Um, Believe it or not, Minnesotans, you are better off if you have more money. That doesn't cause a, a decline in your personal family budget. And I'd, well, I'd remind folks too that inflation has gone uh, in, in government's budget in the 10 years that I've been in the legislature. We used to budget at $30 billion. We're now at 55 billion. I don't think we need automatic increases. When the legislature wants to increase spending, they should take the tough vote to do it. Well, uh, Leader Winkler is going to be very happy to hear that the Republican tax proposal will actually put more money in people's pocket, and it's going to do it every single paycheck, 
week after week, month after month, year after year, because it's going to be permanent, ongoing tax relief. Dave, the there's nothing political about the the discussion about inflation when it's happening around the kitchen table when families are discussing their budgets. Inflation is absolutely eating away at the family budget right now. The best thing we could probably do, and it's going to be a bold move, but if we want to talk about the state budget, the best thing we can probably do is look at zero-based budgeting. Instead of looking at what did we do last year and we have to go up from there, we should start at zero and say, okay, what are the needs for the upcoming biennium and into the future? And then let's plan accordingly there. So um, I think zero-based budgeting, it, although bold, I think could be, uh, would be a very good discussion to have in the legislature. And Rep, uh, Leader Winkler, I can't wait till you see our tax bill, baby. You're going to love it. More money in the people's pocket. I would love to see that too, but more money in people's pockets who really need it is what we should do in a supplemental budget. I agree. Well, on that note, um, I would like to thank the governor and the legislative leaders for taking the time out this morning to speak with us. Um, we really appreciate it. And to my colleagues in the press corps, thank you for being here and asking insightful questions. I really appreciate that too. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Stay warm and we'll see you in 2023 for the next forum forum. Thanks. Thanks everybody.